Sandy Drake here with Bloomington Parks and Rec. In today's program, we're going to be talking about how to establish micro prairies. What you might be asking is a micro prairie. Well, it's honestly a trendy term for recreating the habitat that once was here and using the native grasses, sedges, and forbs Forbes being our wildflowers, we try to create a system that is beneficial to both the animals, insects, and plants that are original to this area. Why is this important, you may be asking. To answer that question, you nearly look as far as the dinner table. As you may or may not know, 75% of our food systems are reliant upon pollinators, and we are currently seeing a global decline in pollinators as a whole. Um, so in order to support those pollinators, we need to create what was original to their habitat. We're talking about supporting their entire life cycles. A perfect example of this, and probably the most well-known, is that of the monarch butterfly and the milkweed. Uh, the monarch butterfly, of course, lays its egg on the milkweed. The egg hatches into a larva, and that larva eats only from the milkweed until it is ready to transition into a primary pollinator. Now, that sort of relationship actually exists between many, many, many of our pollinating insects and our native plants. So what we're aiming to do here is recreate an environment that is mutually thriving for all organisms. First step in doing that is establishing where and how large of a plot you are willing to transition. Now I'm here in beautiful Alcott Park and if you need some inspiration, I would say that this is the place to go because they have done a wonderful job in transitioning uh, this into a native prairie land. Um, however, it is a large area and a word to the wise is try not to bite off more than you can chew. It generally takes between three and five years to establish a native garden space. Um, and so I recommend starting small, starting with perhaps the unsightly border along your house, perhaps an oval feature garden in middle of your yard, uh, starting in a corner, and then you can always each year make it larger and larger after you have control of what you have established. Um, because to begin, we're going to do site preparation. Patience is your greatest tool here because proper site preparation is going to be the make or break of this garden. Um, if you are planning on doing a smaller, starting off small, and by small I'm talking 10 by 30 feet along the side of your garage, say, or again in that like feature garden, the native garden space. Um, one of my favorite ways to establish a garden space there is simple mulching method. So you lay down cardboard in the shape that your bed will be, cover it in mulch and you wait. Likewise, you can always tarp it and smother it that way. You'll have to wait a bit longer before you plant into that. I would call a number of months to kill off entirely any of the perennial grasses that are there. But again, then you'll want to put down a barrier and then mulch. Um, the other option being sod removal. Now this is of course a little more labor intensive. You're going to want to remove at least three inches of sod. And then again, I would cover that in cardboard and mulch. Um, and then becomes a really fun period. We have that of observation. You want to watch this area. Uh, here we are late April, early May. Not all of our leaves are entirely leafed out. The tulip leaves are tiny. We all know they're going to be grow to be much, much larger. My oak trees are not showing their leaves at all. So what may look like full sun beneath an oak tree right now could be entirely shaded. We want to wait and see how the light changes, not only seasonally in coming months, but also throughout the day. 
Uh, does it get morning light? Does it get primarily afternoon light? Are you in a primarily shaded area? Um, we're also going to want to watch how water run through, runs through that area. Is it a wetter zone? Does it dry out easily? Um, what about the soil composition? Now, easy and fun way to do soil composition test. Fill a quart ball jar halfway with the soil that you will be planting into. Fill the remainder of the ball jar with water and shake for many minutes until it is t entirely mixed up. Um, once it all settles, let it settle for hours before looking to see a sand to clay to silt ratio. And this is going to tell you your soil composition. A lot of the organic matter you're going to see at the top. And it, it tells you really, we'll talk more about when we come into um, planting out this area, but knowing your soil composition becomes very important for choosing what plants are going to thrive in that area. And finally, the pH of the soil. Um, the pH is going to, is another big indicator as to what is going to be successful in your home garden. I want to quickly touch base with those who are willing to transition a larger area all at once. We're talking your entire yard, multiple acres, or even an agricultural site. Um, first and foremost, I want to applaud you. It is ambitious and it takes a lot of hard work. So be prepared for that. Um, we have a number of people you could consult here within Bloomington and abroad. Within Bloomington, we have Ecologic. They specialize in taking areas back to their native habitat. We also then have Deep Root Garden Center. Uh, Deep Root is full of sage advice and contacts in the local growing native community. We also, of course, always have Indiana Native Plant Society. Checking out their website can be most informative in terms of larger transitions. Um, there are a number of ways you could go about doing that. We have the herbicide approach, which means spraying. You would have to spray in the spring, the summer, and then again in the fall. Either way, whether you're going all natural or herbicide, plan on at least a year of transition. And again, depending on what you're up against in terms of what is previously growing there, it could be even longer. Um, so patience, again. The other method would be to burn or mow the area. Again, seek the advice of professionals if you're planning on a controlled burn, specifically if there are any structures around. And it's always wise to alert the uh, county or area firefighters that you're going to be doing a controlled burn just so they have that um, on radar, so to speak. Um, and again, after you do that mow or that burn, you're going to want to do a deep cultivation followed by, I would say, only the top three inches every two weeks for the remainder of the year. Now that deep cultivation is going to turn it all in but then you don't want to continually bring up a decade of weed seeds. So that's why I'm saying sticking to the top three inches then every two weeks. Um, organic farms also have propane flaming uh, method where you basically drive across the field with a propane flame burning all of the tiny seedlings as they start coming up. Let's move now to installation. This is where all of our observations and daydreamings for the last few months really get to pay off. Now, I cannot tell you here what plants to put in your native bed. However, I can lead you to the resources that will tell you what's going to thrive best according to your conditions. So that soil composition test, that pH test, this is where that really pays off. Um, for example, lupin, one of my very favorite of flowers, 
thrives in sandy acidic soil. I unfortunately have very alkaline clay heavy soil. So that is not a plant I can establish without extreme amounts of soil amendments, which I honestly do not suggest. I think you come out with a hardier, happier plant if you plant according to what is um, in your yard currently. Lucky for us, there are a number of prairie plants. There's the tall prairie plants that prefer a richer soil. We have short prairie plants that might thrive more in my yard with a more clay-based soil. We even, in fact, have sand prairie plants. Um, those who are going to do best up against your house or where there's a lot of rock and sand from old construction sites. And then, of course, the woodland for those shaded, shaded areas. Um, so you have a bunch to choose from. I again suggest visiting the Indiana um, native plant site. I will include their website at the end of this segment. They are just absolutely a treasure trove in terms of identifying what plants are going to do best in yours. Um, and what you do get to do is decide entirely upon your taste alone what you want for your yard. Are you going to go with the more native prairie look where drifts of color are scattered throughout taller native grasses? Or are you going to go for more of a garden look, uh, even plugging these native plants into already established beds around some of the exotic plants are highly beneficial to those insects, again, that we are trying to support here. Um, you could go on a color theme, purples and blues with splashes of orange and yellow. Again, classic gardening often is played upon texture and shape. Um, I always encourage having something like Rattlesnake Master be a feature in a garden bed, something unique, uh, draws attention. You also want to consider perhaps stacking your plants. That means putting the shortest in front, maybe some blue stem grasses in front um, with a middle plant and then your tallest perhaps cut plant in the back. You can also use some grasses to support some of those taller plants. Also something to consider are paths. Will you have paths through that open area? I often find pea gravel a really attractive and low maintenance option in terms of paths. Um, so I always, always encourage really just to dream on that and go with what delights you the most. There are many people that shy away from planting a native bed thinking that it's something messy. It doesn't have to be something messy. It doesn't have to necessarily be an unkept prairie land in your yard. It can be very artfully, um, skillfully done to incorporate your garden once into the landscape. If you are planting live plants, um, you're going to need to water fairly heavily, I would say at least once a week in the first year to make sure that it becomes established. Now, one of the virtues of establishing a native prairie garden is that it's very, very low maintenance what it, once it is established. However, it does take a little bit of work to get there. So watering that first year is going to be key. Don't expect a lot of flowers that first year either. Perhaps one or two, perhaps none at all. Um, same with the second year. By the third year, that's when you're going to start seeing the colors that you have been waiting so long for. Um, maintenance, maintenance required in that first year is going to be primarily, again, the watering, but also weeding and mulching. Invasives have a way of finding newly available ground. And so you're going to want to be very vigilant. Again, a reason to perhaps start small and move out from there once you have your first area established. So weeding and mulching is a definite area. If you're going to be going seed, seeding is not a bad idea because oftentimes it takes, it establishes a little more hardy. Um, if you were to spend this entire summer doing site preparation 
and then seeding in the fall most of the native seeds do need that cold of winter in order to then germinate in the spring and so that is how it's primarily done is seeding in the fall you could seed this fall um, but again in order to tell what is native plant and what is weed next spring there are a couple things you can do there one thing that you can do is both start seeds in ground direct seed this fall but then in the spring start another tray in soil so that you can compare the two otherwise something else you could do is similarly um, or in the way that it, you're comparing is cut the sod off of an area close by where you are establishing uh, just a small area and then see what weed seeds come up if you find those seeds coming up in your native bed you know that those are in fact the weeds that you want to take out um, having been that you did not seed that other cut sod area um, after three years your maintenance becomes very very small and again this is the joy of a native garden and why so many people are attracted to it basically you give it a mow in the spring or even a controlled burn in the spring and you're done at that point you can mulch but it shouldn't need it once it's established after three years those plants should come back and oftentimes when they fall down they become their own mulch for that next year i want to thank you guys so much for joining us tonight i hope you're feeling inspired to pursue the native plant scheme Happy planting. We'll see you again.